It is Friday, October 4th, 2024. This is another edition of Baseball Today presented to you by Booking.com. Booking.yaya. That is my man, Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose, producer Dan, along for the ride as well. Holy smokes, do we have stuff to talk about today. You good? I think you mean, oh my God. That oh. is the phrase. Uh, you th- hey, how much do you think he's getting paid for them to use his song? Because it's all on every commercial break, dude. This guy is raking in the dough. Dude, and to go do a remix with Pitbull as well? Are you kidding me? When I saw him in San Diego uh, towards the end of the year, he was just, like, so happy and so smiley. And I was like, dude, like, of course you are. Like, you're having a great year. You have a hit song. Like, oh, man. It is Unreal. Really, it's, it's, a, it's Jolly Olive and Jose Iglesias this year, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Jeez. get to that amazing game just a quick second tip of the cap though paul Skeens had an amazing year and then his girl livy dunn has a birthday so what does he do he creates a tops card of livy and the dog and the dog has all the stats on the back and everything and so i asked michelle i said would you like this if your boyfriend and your you know your early 20s did this for you she's like oh i would adore it i was like okay so i'll give him a tip of the cap why not yeah, I just got some advice for old Paul. Okay, so as a guy that's been in the game for a long time, like getting gifts for your significant other, start small like this. Yes, start, start small, small bro, because it only <laughs> goes like this. And before you know it, you're like, what do I do next? Uh, and then eventually, I feel like it has to go. You get to a certain point, and you're like, okay, this is too much. Sentimental value is the way to go. Yeah, that's a good call. Start small, build, build, build from there. <laughs> All right, let's get to it. The wild card series is officially over. The Mets were down to their last few outs. And then <gasps> who's the hero? The impending free agent to be. Here's the pitch. Swing on a fly ball to right field. Pretty well hit. Freelick back at the wall. He jumps. It's gone. He did it. He did it. Pete Alonso with the most memorable home run of his career. Pumps his fist as he rounds second. It's a three-run homer. He's given the Mets a 3-2 to two lead. They all pour out of the dugout. Alonso on his way to home plate. They're waiting for him. Do you even like, sort of understand the magnitude of what you did? Not right now, no. <laughs> Not right now, no. Uh, but I, as... Like, I, I don't think I ever will. When he jumped up and I saw it go over, I literally said, oh, my God. I was like, and I, I was like this is I, this is happening. This is happening. We're, we have the lead now. Like, I told P on the eighth. We were at defense. And I say, be ready because next inning you're going to hit a home run. I can't explain it. Okay, so you heard from Alonzo, Nimmo, and Jose Iglesias. Um, dude, I, I have to admit that when he hit that home run, I – I didn't have a rooting interest. I don't care who wins. I jumped off the couch. It's just good baseball. This is an entertainment business, people, and that was entertainment right there. That was incredible. Like this is this is why baseball is the best. You have to get 27 outs. You have to. And they weren't able to before Pete hit that homer. It was the 10th go ahead home run in the ninth inning or later of a winner take all game in playoff history incredibly it was the first of those to come with a player's team trailing okay. more teams entered the day seven and 105 when trailing entering the ninth inning in a winner take all playoff game they were two and 82 when trailing by multiple runs entering the ninth i and going against a guy who has just been nails all season long, it was the first time all year that Devin Williams, he had thrown the change up 176 times and it hadn't been hit for a homer. How do we explain what happened? Okay, well, there's a couple of things. I mean, they had good at-bats. Francisco Lindor, I think, had an incredible at-bat there mm-hmm. to start the inning off. That was huge. Getting a runner on base against the pitcher is always going to make them a little bit more susceptible to getting hit. Uh, I don't know if you watched Jimmy's breakdown, but I got um, – Let's just say I got a call from a guy who said, I think Alonso's tipping his pitches. And I relayed that to Jimmy, and Jimmy went in, and he was – I mean, if you watch the breakdown, there are there's some stuff there. So it's possible that they had something on Devin Williams. And if you know what pitches cut me, obviously, that helps a bunch. So I don't want to just put it solely on that because we're not 100% sure. We probably never will be. Uh, it looked like the hitting coach was saying something to Pete. So that helps out a bunch, but 
it also was a great swing by Pete. You just have to give credit where credit's due to take that pitch to the opposite field is exactly what you're supposed to do. If he tries to pull that thing, it's a ground ball to third base or the shortstop. So I don't really know how to explain it. I think a lot of things lined up. I think, as I mentioned, um, Pete never seemed defeated out there. And that's the mindset that you have to have when you get put into that situation. You know, he'll never admit it, but I do wonder. You guys are able to compartmentalize as pro athletes exceptionally well. It's one of the many things that separates you from us mere mortals that can't play the sport. But I do wonder if there was a little bit of him as he walked to the plate thinking, dude, this could be it for me. Like he has been one of the faces of the franchise, a guy who has handled himself exceptionally well in front of the New York media over these six seasons. And I just wonder if there's a touch of it. Do you think that there's a possibility that he thought about it at all? I think more than anything in those situations when you get <clears throat> when your teammates put you in a position to win a game or at least tie a game like you're just thankful for the opportunity. That's mm -hmm. it. So I, I, I think that that's the mentality that most guys will have. You can have someone that's super cerebral thinking about everything. Uh, but most guys really try to simplify their thought process. And in that moment, I mean, you'll hear guys say it all the time. That's. That's why you play the game. You want to be in those situations. And if you don't want to be in those situations, you're not going to be a big-time player. Really is incredible. There's the other side of this and what it meant to the Milwaukee Brewers, who staved off elimination in game two, Jackson Churio tying the game, uh, Garrett Mitchell giving them the lead. Here they get a pinch hit home run from Jake Bowers and then Sal Freelick the next pitch. Like That place was rocking. And it's the little engine that could, the tiny market Milwaukee Brewers that were this close, three outs away from advancing to Philadelphia in the LDS. And instead, they have to go home. Here's Devin Williams and Reese Hoskins. A little too amped up or trying to do too much. Would you agree with that? I mean, what were your, no, what was your I'm not going to make any excuses. I didn't execute the way I needed to. And they got the job done and I didn't. No. Yeah, how do you deal with the emotional roller coaster you guys went through late in this game? Good question. I I've never heard somebody like Hoskins say say that, and that was phenomenal. All he said was good question, and then he they went on to the next question. Like it is there is no way to explain the finish when you're on the wrong side of it. Yeah, I mean you're expecting to you have to lead with one of the best closers in baseball on the mound and you're expecting to run back and open some beers up and spray them on each other. I mean, they had the beers in the clubhouse. That's mm. some of the funniest stuff that goes on behind the scenes is the tarping of the lockers and the, the beer and champagne in the clubhouse. Cause they have to, that takes a little bit of time. So they have to do it preemptively. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they got to tear that stuff down. It's a crazy mindset switch for them, you know, and obviously they're stunned. It's. I feel so bad for that city. I really do because no one expected them to win the division at the beginning of the year. I didn't think they were going to hang on once they had the lead. And then we, I think we both picked the Mets to win this series and then to just be outs away and have it. It wasn't take. I mean, it was taken from him. Pete Alonso did this amazing thing. And I wonder how much it changes Pete Alonso in the history of the New York Mets. It's a Does massive it? swing. I mean, that's his, that's, that's his biggest swing as a Met. Yeah. So no matter what happens from here, if they get swept by Philadelphia and he moves on to somewhere else, he'll always have that moment. 100%. That's, yeah. a, that's a highlight reel moment that they'll show on the Jumbotron at City Field for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do tune into our show daily, first of all, we very, very much appreciate it. Number two, on Thursday's show... We discussed the struggles of Pete Alonso, and I gave some sort of stat that he had only four singles since his previous home run, which was like September 21st or somewhere around there. But he had been in a major, major slump. He was hitting in the 100s. He just wasn't driving the ball the whole bit. And Trevor said, yeah, but he's playing great defense. And I started like <laughs> cackling out loud. I was like, wait a second. We're talking about Pete Alonzo, and you're mentioning how he's moving his feet on the defensive side. And so that led 
to this statement from my tag team partner. This is the guy that called the Mets dead. You're yes. laughing, acting like you know what Pete Alonso's going through. How about this? Now, I just because you're laughing at him, yeah, Pete Alonso's going to have the game-winning RBI tomorrow. Mark my words. Okay, I can totally live with that. Congratulations. Prediction ploof has returned yet again. All I meant by that was the defense comment was it didn't look like he was defeated. Like he was still out there. Like it just looked like he was still confident, even though he was struggling at the plate. And that's a dangerous guy. So I'm happy that it came true. Uh, you can pat yourself on the back a little bit more. Like I, did. I already did. I already did on social media. Yeah, you sure as heck did. Me. Like my phone was <laughs> lighting up and I was like, geez, what's going on? And then I saw the clip that you, what did you do? Take a video of your computer? No, I screenshot my iPhone. I don't. You, you think I know how to like make video clips? That's what that's what our social team is for. This one I had to get out because it was a banger. Oh my god, that was so funny. Uh, so good for you, man. I couldn't tell who was patting themselves on the back more, you or Jose Iglesias. The rest of the Iglesias clip where he said that I went over to Pete Alonso and told him he was going to hit a homer in the eighth inning. It then continued on. He goes, "I'm just so happy that I could play that role on the team." <laughs> oh my god, he is, dude. No, it's him and Will Smith for like, uh, like, oh, yeah, Will Smith, like yes. those two. Look out, man. Yeah, there's some weird sh mojo going on in the oh baseball. Oh my gosh, if it's world. Mets Royals, what's, what's gonna happen? Oh my god, the world's gonna spontaneously combust. <laughs> it's not gonna know what to do. The baseball gods are gonna be like, yeah, we've never done this before, <laughs> we don't know where we are. We can't have two. All right, so let's look mm -hmm. ahead very quickly. Uh, to the series between the Mets and the Phillies. It's going to be a real fun one. Um, give me your most important guy on each team. Let's start with the Mets. I think it's easy to say uh, Pete Alonso. Like if he, if this springboards him into, you know, slugging some home runs, I mean, that's a massive piece for them. But I'm going to go with another guy that's kind of like low hanging fruit. I think it's Francisco Lindor. I mean, the team goes as he goes. Uh, great at bat for great at bat during the, um, the wild card round. And he's just the tone setter. So if he continues to be that tone setter, continues to get on base, provide opportunities for Nimmo, who's been great, and Pete, who now has this, I think that's a, a recipe for success. Oh, my God. It's Jose Iglesias in part because of his career numbers against the <clears throat> first three starters of the Phillies. Uh, so you're talking Wheeler, Nola, and Ranger. He is 15 for 29. He is on a heater. At the plate, he's had a phenomenal year, but over the last, you know, three weeks, he's really been toasty. He's feeling great. As you mentioned, that song has just taken over the world. Now, the city of Philadelphia might end up, um, I don't know what they're going to do with the song, but it's probably not going to be very pleasant. But I just, I think that Iglesias hitting behind Lindor and in front of Nimmo and Alonzo is in a huge, huge area where you kind of forget a little bit about him. Sure. And he could, you know, all of a sudden he sneaks a double down the line. You're like, it's second and third, and nobody out, and I got three, four, five coming up. So that could be a little issue. What about for Philadelphia? Another, I, I just feel like a lot of these series are going to come down to because I'm trying to get creative with my answers here, but mm -hmm. I think it's Bryce Harper. I think this is this is he has to have that one playoff run. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's him. Like if he's there driving in runs, hitting big home runs against this team, then they're going to win the series. If he goes cold and can't get it done, then I, I, I think the Mets have that mojo. So I, I think it really is up to him to almost like out superstar, whatever the Mets have going on for them. I'm going with Carlos Estevez came over in that mid season trade, only faced the Mets one time this year out of the 13 games that they played. He uh, he has a little bit of playoff experience, and it's not good. He pitched one game, faced two batters for Colorado in the 2017 wild card game against Arizona, and his ERA is 27. So not ideal. Um, you know, guy who had pitched pretty much, I wouldn't say in anonymity, people knew who he was, but he pitched in Anaheim for much of the last few years. Not big-time baseball. This is big-time baseball. Um, we'll give our all of our winners coming up at the end of the show. Padres and Dodgers. Manny Machado said it best. This is the series that everybody wanted, and he is not lying. By the way, Yamamoto going in game one, not Jack Flaherty. Yes. Did that surprise you for the Dodgers? 
a little bit. I mean, Andrew Friedman gave some scenarios about them both being available in game five. I don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, can a team which spent more than a billion dollars in the offseason, a.k.a. the Dodgers, actually be the underdog in this series? Technically, they're not the underdog. I looked up the Vegas odds. Okay, so good. Um, so I, I don't think that they're the, they're the underdog. I don't think the Dodgers will be underdogs against anyone. I think you could say this is an evenly matched matchup. That's kind of how I have it pegged. I don't have the Dodgers ahead. I almost would lean Padres. So I guess I am saying they could be an underdog, but that's just because I believe in that. Uh, if you play in the wild card round, you're more, you're like baseball. Uh, you're ready for baseball. The Dodgers have had this layoff. I think that might play a part in the first game. After that, I don't think it really plays a part. Um, so I, guess, I don't know. I guess I just contradicted myself mm. right there. I think it's an even series. I really do. Yeah, I mean, I think the series will be, but I do believe, even if the betting odds say one thing, uh, inside of Rose's head, I think the Padres are the better team at this point. I just like the way, that, even with the Musgrove injury, and who knows what's what's going to happen with him here. Um, I think you could put your your pointing to starting pitching being the separator. Then yes, you could say that. Yeah, but even I don't know, man. I just feel like we and we talked about it at the end of the year that there was something going on. Now the Dodgers won a huge series against the Padres. We asked whether or not the Dodgers had to win, kind of the mental warfare between the two in order for for them to feel better about themselves, all that sort of stuff. But I just feel like, based on what I saw in the second half of the year, the Padres are a slightly better team. All I hope is that it goes five. I just want to see it go five. I want to see it get back to L.A. I want to see the fans behave themselves, but they can be unruly during the game. Just don't be assholes, if you know what I mean. Um, first opportunity for us to see Shohei in the postseason. What do you expect? I expect some high leverage situations with him at the plate. I really do. I think that's just how the game gets scripted. I think we are going to see him matching up against Tanner Scott. I think we're going to see him oh. in some big situations. I, how could you not expect him to do crazy things? Like I expect him, that's kind of hard to put on him, but I expect him to, you know, if the Dodgers need to be, want to be successful, I expect him to carry this team to, to set the tone in the leadoff spot. Well, you know, over the last couple weeks of the season, he was ridiculous. The last dozen games, he had seven homers and stole 11 bags. And it blew past 50-50 and had us all mesmerized. I do wonder what almost a week off will do to him. It'll be curious, just like I wonder for all the top two seeds yes. playing. First five or six innings for all these teams are going to be a little slow, I think. Interesting. Uh, this year against San Diego, only one homer in a dozen games. He did drive in seven runs. I think, too, he will be outstanding. Uh, what, they only have one left-handed starting pitcher, Martin Perez, if they have to go that route. But they do have other guys, as you mentioned, that can come in and make him look silly, perhaps at the end. But I do, I want to see some high-leverage situations. The game's Me just too. better for it. It's Fox is going to be going crazy promoting all that stuff. It's going to be awesome. Give me an important player on each team. We'll start off with the road team in San Diego. I think it's Suarez in the back end. You know, you've mentioned he's kind of the one guy that Padres fans feel a little bit uneasy, even though he is their closer. Uh, but he's been lights out against the Dodgers this year. Uh, I believe there's like a 360 OPS against. Um, he's only walked one guy uh, in all of his appearances, so he's not letting him get on with a free pass. I think if he can get in the games and get the job done, I mean, that's obviously means they're going to win. So uh, he has to be that guy, though. I'm going to go with the guy at the top of the San Diego order. We have talked about the importance of Luis Arise setting the table for the monsters that follow. He hit a buck 52 in eight games against the Dodgers, his worst mark against any team. He needs to be better. He needs to be a pain. He needs to be fouling off pitches. He needs to give them lengthy at bats. What about for the Dodgers? So this one's interesting. I mean, I think. You could either say Yamamoto or Jack. It's, it's one of the starting pitchers. They have to – if if the starters don't show up for the Dodgers, if Yamamoto can't give them length, if Jack can't give – I'm going to go Yamamoto, and I'll tell you why. I was going to say Jack, but then they flipped the thing. If Yamamoto comes out and has a poor start, I think the entire feel of the series will be like the Dodgers are missing starting pitching. They don't have enough. If Yamamoto comes out 
and gives a great effort in game one, I think the field this year is like, hey, they have enough starting pitching. Here comes Jack Flaherty right behind this great start. I think that changes everything. So I guess I'll go Yamamoto, but really what I mean is the Dodgers starters. I mean, that's the question mark. They have to show up. Uh, Mookie Betts, hitless in 11 at-bats in the divisional round against the Arizona Diamondbacks. In 22 against San Diego, he went two for 14. So a guy that has won multiple rings in different leagues with two historic franchises needs to get back on the uh, playoff horsey and get this thing going a little bit. He's so important because if he's struggling, Otani's not going to see great pitches. And if he is smoking, then you can forget about it because those top three dudes, as we know, can just own series unto themselves. And a quick reminder that this episode of Baseball Today is presented to you by Booking.com, the official accommodation partner of Baseball. Booking.com, Booking. Yeah, yeah. We are on to the next round of the playoffs. What does that mean for you? Go check out your team while on the road. Yes, it's time to explore those U.S. cities you always secretly wanted to learn a little bit more about. So we're talking about your baseball rival cities or even cities you didn't know were your baseball rivals until you square off against them in the playoffs. With hotels and bed and breakfasts and vacation rentals and resorts and so much more on Booking.com, you might just find the perfect stay for this postseason, even in your baseball rival cities. I'll give you an example. Two teams separated by less than a three-hour car drive. Cleveland Guardians, Detroit Tigers. I am telling all my friends, go check out Detroit. It's really not that bad. It's kind of fun. It's right across the water from Windsor, Ontario. You can go over there and have a great time. They're like, what? And I'd be like, yeah. And go check out the Guardians at Comerica because there is nothing like seeing your team in another city's venue, and you walking away with a victory. Oh, I had that chance in 2016, Wrigley Field, the first World Series game played at that legendary ballpark since 1945, and it was a great experience. Back in Cleveland, different story. We don't have to talk about that. From hotels that overlook the stadiums to family-friendly resorts to cute little bed and breakfast, Booking.com has so many choices across this great country of ours. The right stay can make you a fan of any U.S. city, yet even your baseball rivals. So book today on Booking.com and download the Booking.com app today. We move over to the American League. Gets going in the boogie down on Saturday night. The Royals, who swept away the Baltimore Orioles, taking on the New York Yankees. My first question is, will Judge and Soto get the chance to be the stars that they are, or will Kansas City simply take them out of the game plan? I, I think that's obviously the game plan, is to not let those two guys beat you. Uh, I think that's easier said than done. There are going to be situations that present themselves where you just can't do anything, and you have to pitch to these guys. Um, <clears throat> will they have a chance to be the stars? Uh, yeah, I mean, they'll have a chance, but I think they're going to take as many chances away from them as possible. Yeah, really, you've got to be. This is the time where like the Soto trade means the most, yes. right? Because there have been times where Aaron Judge, he expands the strike zone in the playoffs. He, you know, now there's times he also will hit a ball 500 feet in October. But th this is it. This is why they got Juan Soto is for this exact time of year for the next three plus weeks. And so I think it's imperative that Soto sets the tone in front of Aaron Judge and allows Judge, who's about to win his second MVP, uh, relax and do his thing. Um, is there a way? What's the path for Kansas City here? I mean, Bobby Witt has to go off. I think that um, I think they need to get early leads. I think they need to find – I said this last time I'm talking baseball – I think they have to, like, trying to hold the Yankees to two runs a game and then just getting a few situational hits isn't good enough. I think someone's going to have to hit a three-run homer. Whoever that is, like, they're going to have to at least keep up with what the Yankees can do with the long ball. I believe they were 20th in homers this year in Major League Baseball, so it's really not their forte. But, like, Driving a run in here and there, just being situa like doing situational hitting, you have to do that. But I think they also have to um, hit the long ball. Like they have to have a three-run homer uh, in some of these games to be able to keep up with what the Yankees are going to do offensively. Yeah, um, 
for me, they also have to get it done on the bases a little bit. And I've talked about the importance of every 90 feet in October. And I think that they've got to push it a little bit. Like even in a situation where it doesn't feel like steel, go steal, go move up. Really? That's I, I, and I think they have to, they had seven stolen bases against the Yankees in the regular season. And Dyron Blanco, who's kind of a bit player for them at best had four of them. So this is incumbent on the guys that are going to be in that lineup uh, that have to maybe take chances. And um, you can run a little bit against the Yankees, depending on who's back there. And yep. more importantly, who's on the mound. So the key is, of course, getting on base as well. Uh, most important player on each team for the visitors, the Royals. I'm going to go a little out of the box here. I think I'm going to go Tommy Pham for the Royals, just for the attitude. You know, you're going into the Bronx. You're playing against the big, bad Yankees. Sometimes, you know, a young team like the Royals are. They can be intimidating. Tommy Pham doesn't give a you-know-what. So I think they need to draw off of that mentality. Him and Sal Perez, I think, can both have that effect. But, you know, Tommy's needs to be the guy at the top of the step reminding guys, hey, who who cares who we're playing against? Who cares where we're at? Like, let's go just play our game. I think he's I think he's the right guy for it. You and I have the same wavelength, uh, in part because of his mentality. That's a big part of it, but also because of his production. He's got a 943 OPS against the guys that are on the Yankee staff, and that includes 12 for 35 with a couple of bombs against game one starter Gary Cole. So if you're talking about a dude who's a tone center, that's it. How about for the Yankees? I went back and forth. I want to say Carlos Rodon and and, and that. I think... Uh... I think I'll go Austin Wells, though. Maybe him and Giancarlo Stanton to combine mm. because I think that, you know, Austin Wells didn't end the season great. He had overall numbers are nice. He was a little um, in a little slump before the end of the year or at the end of the year. So I think if the game plan is to pitch around Judge and Soto, then obviously it's the guys behind him that have to pick it up. We know what Giancarlo's done in the postseason. So, you know, if he can do that, it's great. I think also having Wells, who was, you know, in the four spot for, you know, a, a good chunk of his success. Um, he's got to turn things around, and and when those guys do get on base, if they pitch around him, he's got to be able to drive them in. Uh, I will take Carlos Rodon. If you remember, his low point as a New York Yankee came against these Kansas City Royals in his last start of the 2023 season. Eight batters did not retire one. They all scored. Uh, it was not a pretty sight. He did pitch against them twice this year. His most recent outing was okay. His outing before that was phenomenal. Um Went seven really good innings. Be very interesting to see how he does. Uh, last series, American League, Detroit at Cleveland. Tigers, the hottest team in the AL over the last two plus months. Because of how steamy they are right now, do you make them the favorite in the series? Dude, this is this series to me is crazy, Chris. I mean, you can't doubt either of these teams right now. I mean, I've Tried to doubt, and so have you, Cleveland, all year long, and they've been just fine. I think a lot of people doubt the Tigers and what they're able to do, um, but you can't anymore. And I think they do kind of approach the game very similarly. So um, if I make the Tigers the favorite, maybe, dude. I wanted to take them. I said on Talking Baseball, I want the Tigers. Then I remembered my preseason pick was – Philly versus Houston. So I said, oh my gosh, I have to pick Houston here. Mm. They just have something going on with them right now. I think the lineup is better than people are giving them credit for. And then obviously, you know, what they do with the bullpens. I think that maybe the deciding the deciding factor between these two teams, because they are so similar, you know, they are going to rely on the bullpens. I think that because the Tigers have Scooble, that makes them the favorite. Yeah, so the main difference is because these are teams that are kind of looking in the mirror at one another, the way they're constructed. Um, the main difference is there's three. One team has the best pitcher in the American League. One team has a 40-40-40 guy. Yeah. And another team has the most lockdown closer in baseball. Foley's been good for the Tigers, but we saw in game one in Houston that he can get a little rickety. So those are the to me, those are the biggest differences – but you're right. Like I am most worried as a Guardians fan about an offense that struggled to score runs in the second half of the year and now being off a full week. Because remember, they did not play. They had a game rained out last Sunday. So they have will not have played for a full week. That is going to be maybe that'll do a team that can't hit the opposite. Maybe it'll get it them could. going. It, it honestly it could, Chris.
Uh, most important player on each team visiting Tigers, that'd be. So I think for the foreseeable future, the most important player on the Tigers is Tarek Skubal because they're going to rely on him. Like he's in, he's in line to start what game two, game two, and possibly game five. Like they're going to need him to win two games a series if they want oh. to actually progress uh, in the playoffs. You know, relying on the bullpen and Cater or Reese or something like that. Like you can do that if you get. Tarek to pitch like he's always pitched and win those two games. Then you and and go deep into them to save. So I think he, for the foreseeable future, until they get another starting pitching or pitcher, just pull him out of a hat. Tarek's the guy that's the most important for the Tigers. Uh, for me, because of the way the off days go, they play Saturday, off day Sunday, back Monday. Scoobles going to be fine. To me, they can use a well rested bullpen just the way they did in game two. Game two of a series, they went full bullpen game, which is virtually unheard of. Yeah. That's why Tyler Holton, who's a guy that you have highlighted before, is going to be so important. I'm going to make this prediction. He will start games one, three, and four like if that. we get that far. I think it's going to happen. No team has faced him more this season than the Guardians. He limited them to eight hits in 43 at-bats, a sub-500 OPS. Uh, what about for the Garden Guardians? This is you want me to go? To... Yeah, you go first. This is a tough one for me. For me, it's a no-brainer. Stephen Kwan. Only had yeah. five at-bats over the last three-plus weeks of the season. He was on the injured list, then he came back to start one game, and he got one plate appearance after that. From July on, his OPS was under 660. First three months, over 900. Dude was a beast. He started the All-Star game. He The offense will go as he goes. He needs to be on base. He needs to give tough at-bats. I didn't see that the back half of the year. Hopefully his body is well rested. He's healthy and ready to go. Is it not as simple as saying, okay, Josh Naylor has to be a guy? Huge. Right? Huge. Like if, if we talk about teams taking out Aaron Judge and Juan Soto, it's even easier to say, well, let's just take away Jose Ramirez. So I guess I'll go Josh Naylor. It's a good one. We've seen what he can do at times. Rocking the baby and everything not, else. Does not October. have uh, great numbers against uh, Tarek or Reese Olsen uh, this year. Who, so. Who's got great numbers against Tarek School? That's a great point, Chris. And I don't think anybody does. I'd like to know. Uh, let's give our predictions for each series. Uh, Mets, Phillies. I have the Phillies. I do, too. Padres, Dodgers. Scary, but I have the Dodgers. I do, too. American League, Yankees, Royals. I have the Yankees. Me too. Tigers, Guardians. I don't remember. I think I have. I, I had Houston beating the Guardians. So now I guess I can change my tune. Do I hop on me and Jimmy Norb riding with the Tigers? Yes, Tigers. Me too. Don't say anything. <laughs> oh my Last gosh. thing. I did this in 2016. It worked almost perfectly. Uh Tito to the Reds. Speaking of the Guardians, he was there a season ago saying his goodbyes. I'm retiring from baseball, most likely not coming back. There is a report that he is coming out of retirement, that he's feeling well. He's lost 25 pounds. It's an amazing signing if he does end up leading the Cincinnati Reds. But when you saw that possibility, you were shocked? Well, I'm, I'm happy. I was happy. That means he is feeling good. He's feeling healthy, which is awesome. I didn't know he's only, what, is he 65 or something? He's 65. Yeah. Is that is that old? I don't think that's that old. No, it's not. But the way, I mean. His 65 like his, is a little older. Yeah. If you cut him open, I, you'll find so some interesting stuff. My initial reaction to it is, what a great landing spot for him. There's there's a ton of talent on that roster. I feel like they have underperformed. There's been some injuries. I think he's walking in to a great situation. This isn't like him going to the Marlins or something. Like th I think this is this is a franchise that's like ready to go. Um, so I liked it. I'm so happy for him if he is indeed healthy. That's all I care about. The stuff on the field, if he turns them into contenders, I thought they were going to win the division this year. They were a terrible disappointment to me and a lot of people in baseball. If he can turn it around, it's awesome. I just, I'm excited for him. I just want to see him and make sure he's good. That's all I care about. Enjoy the baseball this weekend. We are off until Monday for our one-of-a-kind producer, Dan Rourke, the uber-talented Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose. We will see you Monday here on Baseball Today, presented to you by Booking.com.